My message today is titled, Go Forward. I don't know what God said to you this week to do. Confirmed through the Holy Spirit, through his word, through spirit of prophecy, but I pray that my message today is clear. Whatever God has asked you to do, go forward. I'd like to pray, though, before I speak. Lord God, we seek out your words and your divine guidance. Lord, open our ears, open our minds to listen, to hear, and to obey. As I speak, I pray that you send angels to this room beside me, your Holy Spirit within me, to not speak what I shouldn't and to speak only what you tell me. And Lord, help us to listen. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. The background of what I want to share comes from the story in the book of Exodus, chapter 14, the scripture for today. Verses 15 and 16, Moses and the Israelites are gathered at the banks of the Red Sea. The water is smooth, just like it always is, and it's deep, just like it always is. And beside them on either side are the rock faces, impenetrable, unclimbable, and behind them, coming down the wadi, the dry riverbed is the sound of the Egyptian chariots. Water ahead, rocks beside, rocks beside, chariot and death behind. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. And forward was the Red Sea, still as usual, deep as usual. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. But first, they had to go forward to the sea. Everybody's got a story. And as I've been here, I have heard a lot of stories of people who have been moved by God in one way or another, and they have gone forward, and it's been an encouragement to me. Psalm 66, verse 16, says this, Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will declare to you what the Lord has done, what he has done for my soul. And that's what I want to do today, because God is not just a God who was active in the past, and yeah, he was a good God back then. And we we trust that he's a God who will be active in the future. Yes, I have faith in what God will do. But is God the God of the present right here? And I want to share how it is that I came to be here. I think in this room, there's only two people who I've shared this story with. But Bobby Davis, you've heard most of the story, but it wasn't even done by the time I talked to you. And and I think Pam. But the rest of you may have heard little bits and pieces. But I want to share with you that I am nothing special. But the Lord is. There is so much more work that needs to be done in my life. I can confirm that on a daily, hourly basis moment-by-moment basis. But I want to share with you as an encouragement what God has done. How do you choose a starting point for a story that started, I'm sure, before I was born? The uncounted mercies of God through the years, through my family and mentors, and a process of learning lessons slowly, and miracles in my life. I skip over all that, years and years, about 40 years worth, but to tell you that uh, God, God worked things out to bring me to the point where I was the person, my family even more so, were people who are ready and willing to hear God speak and to go forward. Perhaps... Maybe you've been there. You could say, Lord, if I had only been ready sooner and willing sooner, what more could you and would you have done? I taught Bible in a Seventh-day Adventist school in Washington for 18 and a half years. And I remember people asking me every now and then, Mr. Perrin, have you ever considered doing something different? And my answer was all this, always the same, no. I, I like where I'm at, I love what I'm doing, I am comfortable. If God wants me to do something else, he is going to have to make it abundantly clear to me because I'm happy where I am. And uh, the time came when that certainly would be the case. And so I take you to the time of early 2020. I say that, thank you so much. 
Because everybody knows what happened in early 2020. COVID hit, the world changes, and I remember one of my colleagues saying, when things get back to normal, I looked him in the face and I said, it is never going to be the same again. Things are not going back to normal. And my wife and I particularly felt God saying, get serious. We're, we're, we're done with life the way it was. Get serious. <clears throat> well, many people in the world heard the message in their life, get streaming. And so they took that time to really add up the cue to what was on their streaming services. One of the things that changed there, that, that March spring break as COVID unhinged the way we did school is we got a TV in our home. We had had a TV years ago, and when our first child was born, my wife and I said, we're done with this. We don't want this as a part of our life. And so we pondered this, and oh, I didn't want it. Lord, I don't, I don't want a television in my home. But if there was ever something that our family wanted to watch together, we'd gather around all seven of us on a little 15-inch computer screen, and it just wasn't doable. You know, I mean, you could do it. But we took that television, and we used it for what it should be used for. We started watching Seventh-day Adventist sermons and messages, filling our home with, with messages that were uplifting and strengthening and oh so challenging. We, and so let me give a note to you. If you've got a television in your home and you're not using it for what God has ordained a tool like that to be used for, either start using it right or get rid of it. Okay. All right. We started to understand more about things like the health message, which we'd been familiar with, but God began to, to fill us with a deeper understanding. It's not just vegetarianism. It's not just about your physical health. It's about your whole relationship with me. We began to understand things about God's plan for education, his purpose for our, our lives to, to literally be victorious over sin, and not that I'd not read that in the Bible. I was a Bible teacher after all. But I began to, we began to understand things in a deeper way as God then was laying some framework for a path that he wanted us to follow. A church elder one day, as we were on our way into church, handed my wife a copy of the book Steps to Personal Revival by Helmut Haubeil. Maybe you've seen that little book. And he didn't know what he was doing. He's just, just handing out books. But here's a little plug for literature ministry. That book, as my wife read it and then began to put into practice the things in that book, began to change in our home. First among them, pray, pray, pray for the Holy Spirit. Ask for the Holy Spirit in your life. And my wife, on her own, and, and, then, and then sharing with me, began to ask for the Holy Spirit. And when you ask for the Holy Spirit, God keeps his promise to send the Holy Spirit. And if you're willing, if we're willing to listen and respond to that prompting, be aware things are not going to be like they once were. And so we then begin to pray, really, as, as much as from the heart as we could, Lord, we'll do whatever you ask us to do. And so God puts on my wife's heart. My wife has a listening heart. I'm more stubborn. I'm slower to listen. He puts on her heart just these words right here, plant a garden. She didn't want to. We live in a little city block, you know, a little, little postage stamp sized lot. You know, it's big enough for life in a little city. But in order to plant a garden, we'd have to move a shed. Oh, I didn't want to do that. But she listens to God's voice and says, okay, I'll do this. Her dad had a garden. We got, we got vegetables from him. We might have to cut down a tree. Oh, I did not want to do that. But the lesson is, is this. <laughs> Here we go, I'm looking back, and if God had given us full light on everything he was planning to do in our lives right then, we probably would not have wanted to, to go where he was sending us right then. But he starts simple, plant a garden. Maybe God's starting simple with you right now, and he's not asking you to go far and wide, but, but, but correct this one little thing. Make this little change in your life. And I can tell you, there have been times when I've heard God prompting me, do this or don't do that. 
The garden is not difficult, but God revealed just that step. Matthew 6, 11 tells us this in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Not our weekly bread, not our yearly, annual, or not our lifetime supply. Give us just this amount for today. This prayer is not just about sustenance from God. It's about his daily commission, too. Jesus said this in John 4, 34. He said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The daily bread for Jesus wasn't just the eating bread, but the job, the task. And so God lays upon my wife's heart, and she shares with me, and I'm reluctant, plant a garden. I don't know what job God has placed for you. But God then began to lay on Heather's heart again. Not mine yet. He knew what my heart is like. The burden to move our children, to move our family out of the city into the country. And that's God's will for us to raise our families, to raise children, especially at times when they are so susceptible to influences, away from the influences of the city to a place where they, he can, where they can hear him speaking through the garden, through the grass and the trees and the birds, through the animals all around. She was reluctant to share what God was placing on her heart because she knew, oh, that's so much work. It's so much work, and and we'd already done so much work remodeling this home, remodeling another home, sell that home. I I didn't want more work. But the call and the need became stronger and more insistent, and there was so much written, and we were especially learning about country living. We've been called to that. The end of 2020, I started to do something that I hadn't done before. I started reading in the testimonies for the church. Which are the testimonies for the church? Does that make sense? I'd read bits and pieces here and there, but they're nine volumes, and it's, it's a lot of reading, but God prompted in my heart as I'm asking for the Holy Spirit, and he prompted me to start reading from book one. And God began to change my life. And I have, I just got to show you, Remnant Publications prints a nine volumes of the testimonies of the church here in one single book. You can carry with you all the time. My heart was willing and open. I totally recommend this. I just gave it to somebody this week. And uh, if you have not read in the testimonies for the church or it's been a while, there's things in here that I'd say, oh, this doesn't really apply to me. Then I'd start reading it. Oh, God was speaking to me. God began to, with his arrows, pierce my heart. And I start, my heart starts changing on different things. I accept God's messenger. And these words were coming straight to me. For example, I felt God prompting in my heart, you need to increase your generosity in giving. We had one salary, which was plenty to sustain us in our family, but uh, God put on my heart, you're you're being stingy. You need to, you need to be more generous. And so I talked to Heather about it, and I said, this is what God's placed on my heart, that we we ought to be giving $60 more. All right, systematic benevolence here, $60 more each month in our giving to God's missionary efforts. And my wife trustingly says, absolutely, go forward with what God is asking you to do. So that evening, I look at our budget, I pull it back out, and there's not $60 in there extra anywhere. Lord, I don't know if I can do this. I should have just done what? Go forward. I'm wrestling with God, and the next day, literally the next day in the mail, two letters come. One of them, changing our power bill because of our power usage. The next one, changing our mortgage because of changing insurance rates, and uh, our monthly, our monthly budget drops $59 and 30 some odd cents. And it broke my heart. Why couldn't I just trust God and go forward? And I knew God wasn't telling me, I'm going to make everything easy for you, but he's saying, you can trust me. Go forward. I will take care of you. I knew those bills would go up again in the future, which they did. But God was saying, go forward. Another thing God placed upon my heart, I had a little bit of a side income. I would, I would buy books, and then I'd sell them online on eBay. You know, one salary, you want a little bit of extra for a date night, and you know, that little extra 
The extra little bit of money every month was so useful. Yet we wanted to be involved. God was placing upon our heart, my wife and I, a a call to deeper missionary efforts. And uh, Heather said to me one day as we were talking, if we're going to be more active in mission service as God is calling us, you're not going to have time to keep on selling like that. You're going to have to give that up. I immediately, this is the work of God in my heart. I I wouldn't do this normally. I immediately said, okay, I'll quit. My wife said she got a little scared because we, we've, uh, we've counted on that little bit of extra money. So I, I was going to go stop buying anything else to sell, and I'd just kind of sell off what I had. But as I, as I sat in church that Sabbath, and I'm listening to the sermon, and I was listening and half listening, but I heard God speak in my heart, don't wait for it all to sell, get rid of it all today. Okay, God, I will. So that night, I called a friend of mine who I know also sells things online. I said, God told me I'm done with this. Come tomorrow and pick up everything I have. And something happened right there. A couple of things. I started to realize what an idol that had become in my life. How much time and energy and space in my brain to thinking about how much, how much more can I buy and sell. And I, I had been devoted to the fact that apparently that I could take care of myself. And when I responded to God, letting that go, God reminded me, you can't take care of yourself. You can't just go make a little bit more money. You've got to rely on me. And my wife and I had also said a number of times during the years, there's no way we could move somewhere else because then this little income stream on the side would dry up. Little did I know at that time, God was preparing me to get ready to move. He was preparing me right then saying, get rid of this. So you know you can live without it. Heather then shares with me at that point the burden on her heart. God wants us to move to the country. And here was my response. I'm willing, honey. And in my heart it was like this. I'm willing. God, if you do absolutely everything, open every door, I'll walk through them, but you do all the work and get it done. I was willing to move, but my picture of it is that we were going to move in the area. Yeah, we'll we'll move to a country place just outside of town, staying exactly where we are. And so my wife and I at that point, then we start to get serious, kneeling down, praying together. Lord, we're putting this before you. And we really start praying in earnest and honestly as God is little by little changing my heart. God, where do you want us to move? We're placing this before you. We know you want us to go. But where? My heart is still slow at this point, but we share it with the family. And as a family, we start to pray, but not everybody in the family is totally 100% into it. Yes, we'll pray about moving to the country, but at least one thought to themselves, there's there's spiders out there. (laughs) There's snakes out there, and... there's animals out there. I don't know if I want to go. So I want you to know, don't be discouraged. If God is placing something on your heart and you share it and not everybody seems to be as into it as you are, keep praying, keep putting it before God. Nonetheless, we start praying as a family. And we had as a family at this point been praying for the Holy Spirit and God was answering that prayer. Luke 11, verse 13 says this, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And God was doing that for us. The prayer habits of our family began to change. No country home yet, because God needed us to be the kind of people who could follow him to a country home and not get all irritated when the spiders were there and the snakes were there. And so well, the prayer habits begin to change and we pray more earnestly and more sincerely. And some children who had, had never really felt comfortable praying out loud before, we start to hear their voices calling out in prayer. And God begins to reveal things in our lives individually and as a family, how we use our time, how we talk what we read and we're listening to. We thought we had been living up to a pretty good, high, godly standard, but God starts to reveal, I want you to know that the standard I have for you is always going to be a step above where you are right now. I'm not just calling you forward, I'm calling you upward. Come up higher, and then still higher. 
And God began to help us remove every hindrance to hearing his voice. So when the Holy Spirit would speak, we could hear because distractions were gone. Help us repent of negative habits and change our desires. And so now we're asking God to confirm the impressions that the Holy Spirit is giving us. And he starts to do that, bringing us to things in the testimonies. Letting us hear the counsel of others that we are watching. And so at this point now, we're still convicted as a family. God is going to move us out into the country, somewhere around here. And we start to look at different places. Like you, like any of us, or most of us, we're on a budget. Country homes can be expensive. Especially when you're living in the area where we were living. And so we were also convicted that God wanted us to be out of debt. Or at least closer to out of debt. And so we reconnect with a realtor who had helped us buy and sell homes before. And the result, no surprise, there was nothing available for country living affordable to us in the area. That realtor did confirm one thing. He said this, don't for any reason, don't by any means sell your house. Because we talked about that. Well, we could sell right now so we have the money and rent so that way when the time comes, we're, we're ready to go. And he said, don't do that. Don't sell your house unless you have something else to buy ready. So we keep looking. Anytime a new option comes onto the market and we look and nothing <clears throat> is coming onto the market that we can afford. Early spring though, we found a house that, uh, that we believed God was leading us toward as an answer to prayer. If you're watching and you're from the area where we are from, this house was on Reeser Road, and we called it the Reeser House. It was an abandoned house, and so we look it up on the tax website, and we can see it's an estate that had been abandoned several years ago. Nobody lived there. We see that uh, the lady who owned it had died, and now it's owned by her two children who live about 150 miles away. But we start praying about this. Lord, is this the house you want us to move to? Is this the place that you've opened up for us? We hear somebody else's testimony that, that there was a house like this, a property. And so they write a letter to the owners. And this then opens up a process for them to purchase this property that had not been for sale. <clears throat> well, do I send a letter? And so Heather and I are pondering over this. And this lets you know where I, at, where I was at at that point. I'm agonizing over whether or not to reach out and write a letter to somebody. <laughs> Just this commitment. And so one night, late at night, everybody else is asleep. I'm praying through the names of my family members. And God places upon my heart, or at least I believe it is, that place in Jeremiah. Jeremiah bought a field. There was a field connected with this house that we, we felt like God had led us to. Jeremiah bought a field. Well, of course he did. God, I know, I know that. But is this you telling me to go buy, you know, write a letter and, and commit myself to, to buying this house that's abandoned, that's dilapidated, that spiders and snakes and all that? And so I said, Lord, if, if, I, know that, I know that's in Jeremiah, but if this is from you, tell me exactly where. So I start thinking to myself, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe this chapter or that chapter. But I, I, know it's all, I know that's all me thinking. So I say, Lord, I'll leave it up to you. And I continue praying through my family. And then in my mind pops Jeremiah 31. It's like that did not, I was not thinking about that. God put that there. Like I'll, I'll look it up tomorrow morning, God. So I, I go to bed, I go to sleep thinking, Lord, I, th I think you've led me to the right place. So I get up in the morning, I open my Bible, Jeremiah 31. No, that's not where it is. But Lord, you put this on my heart. I'm going to read straight through this. And so I read straight through all of Jeremiah 31. And it's, leading, it's speaking to the, the situation going on in my life and heart. And I, I turn the page. I get to the end of Jer Jeremiah 31. There it is right there at the start of Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah bought a field. And I, I thought to myself, Lord, that's you telling me, you go through and do what I ask you to do, even if you don't see the answer right in front of you. And so I felt convicted. Lord, you're telling me to, as a family to reach out for this house. Oh, I didn't want to tell that to my wife. Um, you know, this, this, <laughs> this commits me to the process. 
So I'm pondering, how do, I, how do I tell the family about this? And this is just a little thing. This is just writing a letter. And so we get up, and we're going to have family devotions. And we pick up the devotional book. For, and uh, I open to the one for that day. It's the Amazing Facts book, that one with the gray cover, Wonders of God's World, I think, something like that. And so I start reading, and my kids say, oh, Uncle David already read that one. It's like, what do you mean Uncle David already read that one? Oh, well, he, when he was here a couple months ago, uh, he, he opened a page at random, and he read that that one. It's like, okay, well, I'll read the next one. And I turn to the next one. And there it is, Jeremiah 31. Oh, in fact, all through that week, Jeremiah 31 kept on un- unsuspectingly, surprisingly being placed before me. That morning, though, I, I told Heather, I was like, God's confirmed to me, we're supposed to reach out to this house. That God has told us we're supposed to send, send a letter And so we did. We sent a letter um, and uh, nothing happened. They they didn't respond. But we still are convicted and so we're now praying, literally throughout the day, praying uh, for these two people, Diane and Eric, who, that that they will get our letter, that God will move upon their hearts. There was a, a motto that we had heard. It went something like this, pack and pray, start today, don't delay. So we start packing our house up for sale. I mean, packing our house up to move. We literally are filling items into boxes and we're preparing our house for sale. We, have not, we don't know where we're going, but we feel convicted. God's gonna open up something here. This house he's led us to, he's told us to reach out. He's gonna open it up. So one afternoon, I'm, I'm power washing the house. My wife is working somewhere else. You know how it is. You take care of all those things you wish you had done and enjoyed while you lived there. A little bit of that, but we're, we're preparing the house for sale. And God places upon my heart and my wife's heart simultaneously different sides of the house in the day. I don't don't need you praying for them to sell you the house. I want you praying for them. For them. So we talk about that. And then as we still are waiting for a response, we are throughout the day praying for Eric and Diane praying for their spiritual life, their eternal life, their families. And I don't know what became of that. You know that we're not living in Eric and the house they owned. Meanwhile, we're praying also about whoever's going to buy our house. We, we start, we start um, having prayer hourly throughout the day, setting an alarm, and each person of the house would be assigned to an hour, and as we would gather at the top of the hour, that person would lead. And we're praying literally, asking God, fill us, lead us, and guide us. We're still focused on this house on Reeser Road, but then we drive by, and we see that somebody's there working on the house. And we drove home silently, Everybody kind of knew, oh, God didn't answer that prayer. Something, that's, that's not where God wanted us to be. And so I'd ask myself, Lord, why did you place that on our minds and then not open up that door? And it began to dawn on us, here's what happened with that house. Everybody in the home, all seven of us, came into unity. And we started together, unitedly, praying. And we had a goal in mind. Lord, you're going to move us out. And those children who said, I'm not sure, they said, God told me. God God changed my heart. God used that house, not because he was going to take us there, but to change our hearts and bring us together. And so now we're really praying. We knew that door was closed, but no other doors were opening. God wanted us in the country, and we could feel the urgency more and more. And so we begin asking another question quietly in our hearts. God, are you going to move us somewhere else? That's a tough question to ask. And if so, God, I've been teaching Bible and I enjoy it for the last 18 years. God, do you want me to do something else? I don't know what else I would do, what else I could do. These are hard questions to ask, but God had little by little prepared Heather and I to be willing to ask those questions. We still know God's moving us, but there's no houses showing up. Nothing is showing up at all. We're still packing. We're getting rid of things we don't need. I'm also preparing and thinking about this new school year. Because one of the things that we had been praying about was, do I sign my contract now for this coming school year? 
the contract was due June 30. And so we're literally praying every day, Lord, are you going to open up another door? Are you sending us elsewhere? I literally signed my contract June 30, like as late as I could in the evening before I went to sleep and submitted it. God, I've asked you if there's another place. And I did that many years. Lord, if you've got somewhere else for me, place that before me. But God didn't open up another door, so I was convicted, confirmed, God, you're going to leave us here. The external, uh, so I'm, I'm praying now about this new school year, pre prepping for it. The external changes were not big. We had not had to sacrifice anything, just put a few things into boxes where we couldn't see them, just get our house ready, just start praying. But the changes noticeable were the ones that were going on inside. And maybe you're doing that. God's called you to something, and you're wondering, why God isn't this changing? Why, why aren't you coming through and making the way where I thought that you would make a way? And God is saying to us, I am doing things. I'm doing things in you. Because you've got to be the kind of person who can be willing to follow me when it gets tough. I'm changing your heart, your wife's heart, your husband's heart, your kids' heart. I had been comfortable where I was, but now I'm not just willing to move, I'm eager, and I'm compelled, Lord, move me. Another year begins, school year begins, and the press on our heart is stronger. We are still praying constantly, and God whispers to Heather through his still small voice, I'm not gonna make a way for you here. I'm gonna move you far away. That's hard to hear when you don't want it when you're not necessarily wanting to leave. We had talked together about this next step. We've done everything we can do. The only thing next is to put our house up for sale. God, do you want us to list our house for sale with nothing to buy? Heather and I at that point were both reading things separately, individually, here in the testimonies, here in the Bible, that were confirming, move out, move out. We lived in the county, as far as I understand, it is the county with the highest number of Seventh-day Adventists per capita in the country, and probably the world. We lived among a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, and God, we, we, we were convicted, both of us, move out, move out. While we had done all that we could do, um, we did not know how to step out and face faith next. But we are now looking elsewhere. We're starting to look farther east. Stuff was just as expensive farther east. You go to the next state, the next state, it is expensive. We couldn't afford anything. My wife got COVID. I got COVID. The school year has begun. It's September. Heather, Heather recovers quicker. She recovers easier. I stayed sicker longer and sicker worse. But while I'm recovering, Heather and Sienna, without ever failing, prayed as they opened up the laptop and began looking farther east. Lord, where are you going to move us? They didn't want their own wisdom. Lord, we don't want to see any house except that you are the one directing our minds. But where do we go? Do we, do we look for a job first? Do we look for a home first? We did not have any, any knowledge on this. And so we just knocking on doors to see what God opens. Heather looks in Kentucky, looks in Tennessee, looks in Missouri, different places where, where we'd heard about different things, and I'm not sure why, but there's something about, for some reason, they start looking in southern Illinois area, and there was kind of a peace in their heart about it. I'm still sick. Uh, we didn't know nothing about, sorry, we didn't know anything about Illinois except Chicago's there, and that's enough to make us not want to go. So, can't explain it except that when you're asking for the Holy Spirit to guide you, he places things on your heart. Well, as I'm recovering, I'm looking. And I'm looking at some things also in Illinois, and I say, I don't, I don't know, Heather, but it seems like Illinois is maybe the place that God wants us. I hadn't consulted with them, but God's placing upon both of our hearts, all three of us, something peaceful about Illinois. Well, I didn't know what was here. All I, all I knew that was here was this church. Because we, I did not know 3ABN was here. We, we knew that Thompsonville Church was here because we heard, uh, we'd heard Pastor Loma Kang say things about Southern Illinois. And so I called the Thompsonville Church. Somebody answered. 
I was just asking, I was just going to ask them about homeschooling regulations in Illinois. Is there anybody down there who homeschools who could, I could talk to? Any Adventists who are realtors? I just, I want to kind of talk with somebody about the market or what it might be like. I'm just knocking on doors. I'm not saying I'm going to Illinois. I don't want to make that decision. Well, whoever I'm talking to, he says, uh, he says, I don't know who it was. I feel like it was Joe, but uh, I don't know. I know you're not here. I feel like somehow I got transferred to Joe's office. If I could go back in time, I'd, I'd hear that voice. But he says, well, you know, a lot of people at Thompsonville Church, they work at 3 ABN. It's like, oh, 3 ABN? Huh. Uh, that's interesting. So we talk, he prays with me. I share that with my wife. We get on, look at 3 ABN. Hey, they, they got some job openings there. Well, I'll just knock on doors and see what opens here. And so I, I give a call to 3ABN, and nobody answers. <clears throat> well, or rather, here, here's the way it went. I, I submitted an application by email. I didn't get a response to the email. I called and, and, uh, to, uh, to, <laughs> to Jill's office and left a message, and nobody responded. I called a couple of times, and nobody really answered. Nobody got back with me. And so I thought, okay, that door's closed. God is not taking me there. But I knew God was moving us. And so in October, I went to my principal, and I said this. Imagine saying this to your principal. It's like the second month of the school year. You signed a trial contract for the year. This is, not, this is not the way to do things, or at least that's what I thought. Say, God's put upon our heart that he's going to move us, and I don't know when, and I don't know where, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be soon. And I just want you to know in advance. And he was a thoughtful and kind, supportive principal. He didn't make me feel bad about it whatsoever. This is the first human that I had shared, other than our family. We hadn't talked to anybody. First person we had talked to about this. I reach out um, here, and I reach out here again to Thompson, to, to 3ABN. And I call. I'm trying to, trying to get a hold of somebody. I finally get a hold of Jill. And we talk together. I tell her what's going on in our life. I tell her, you know, what I'm doing. I just submitted an application because it said there was an opening for construction. I was like, well, I, I could do that. I could do whatever God wants me to do. She says, as she listens to me, she says, it sounds like you'd be interested in something more pastoral. I said, yes, absolutely I am. We talk and pray. We set up. She says, let's have an interview in about a week. We didn't set a date, but she said, call me back. So the next week, I call, no response. I call, no response. I leave a message, no response. I send an email, no response. And I think God is doing this on purpose. <clears throat> Finally, one day, I call 10 times, and I'm thinking, I hope they don't have caller ID. <laughs> Summer calls me back that afternoon and says, I see you've been calling. Oh, I just... <sighs> I didn't know if I'd been forgotten. And she says, don't worry, you've not been forgotten. That's what she said to me. No response. Lord, this door you've closed. I'm going somewhere. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to go somewhere else. And my wife is asking God, why, why aren't you opening a door here? And he speaks to her heart. You don't know everything. Meanwhile, I've reached out to other places, not just in Illinois, other places. And what am I getting from those places? No response. Nobody calls me back. Nobody responds to my emails. Now it's the beginning of Thanksgiving break, and we're praying, Lord, what do you want us to do? Should we list our home for sale? We know you're moving us. We don't know where to go. And so Heather, in her prayer time, kneels down and says, Lord, what should we do? Do you want us to do this? And she opens up her book of the testimonies to this page right here. Do we got that slide up here? There are times when the Christian life seems beset by dangers and duty seems hard to perform. The imagination pictures impending ruin before and bondage or death behind. Yet the voice of God speaks clearly above all discouragements. Go forward. We should obey this command. Let the result be what it may. Even though our eyes cannot penetrate the darkness and though we feel the cold waves about our feet, the voice of the Lord bidding his faithful ones go forward frequently tries their faith to the uttermost. But if they should defer obedience till every shadow of uncertainty was removed from their understanding and there remained no risk of failure or defeat, they would never move on at all. Those who think it is impossible for them to yield to the will of God and have faith in his promises until all is made plain and clear before them will never yield at all. 
Faith is not certainty of knowledge. It is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. To obey the commandments of God is the only way to obtain his favor. Go forward should be the Christian's watchword. That's in the fourth volume of the testimonies, page 26 and 27. And so here we are praying, prompted by the Holy Spirit, and we agree together in prayer, it's time to list our house for sale. I wouldn't do this on my own. I don't, this is not me. I don't like uncertainty. I don't like things that I, I'm not in control of. We knew now that we could not ask the advice of any human or they would try to discourage us and we wanted to hear God's voice alone. Looking back, I, I've, I've asked this, Lord, how did I ever make that decision? How did I do that? How did we do that? And it's only because he was prompting and he was strengthening. Without any wasted time, we immediately that night, Saturday evening, called our realtor, left a message. He called us back Sunday morning and we listed our house for sale that morning. We had multiple offers that day, had one accepted and the house was under contract two days later. This is our Thanksgiving break. House was under contract by Wednesday and we don't have a clue where we are going except for a feeling and impression that maybe Illinois is a good place. Lord, are you really gonna make me tell my family? All my family lives there. All Heathers, are you really gonna make me tell them that I'm leaving and I don't know where I'm going? Lord, are you really gonna make me drive into the principal's office and say, we're leaving, where are you going? I don't know where. Tears. I'm literally crying as I'm driving down the street and I end up at the school and, uh, and God puts upon my, my heart, look at the birds of the air. They don't toil or spin or labor or store away in their barns, but your heavenly father takes care of them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Oh, you of little faith. And I open my door and I, I just, and all over, I didn't see them before, but there's just birds covering every branch of the tree I'm parking, <laughs> just singing away. I just, I... My heart wants to laugh, but I'm still having trouble. I go in and I talk to my principal. I tell him, we're moving. I'm going to be done at the end of the semester because I'm selling this house. I can't sell and have nowhere to live while I'm teaching, and I can't quit teaching if I still have, you know, we're moving. I come back, and here's what's literally going through my mind as I'm walking out. Of course, there were birds out there. There's birds out in the sky. I walk out of the school, and there's not a single bird in my view. And Lord, are you really going to make me tell my superintendent that I'm moving? Are you really going to make me tell all my faculty and colleagues, we're leaving? Where are you going? I don't know. Lord, are getting ahead of myself a little bit. Lord, are you really going to make me stand up in front of the entire student body and say, God has told me to leave? Where are you going? I don't know. The closing date was set. We're moving. It's spring, sorry, it's Thanksgiving break. I say to my wife, I've been telling her for a while, will you please take some pictures of that treadmill you have downstairs? We gotta get rid of that thing. We can't take that wherever we're going. And so she had meant to, but she hadn't done it yet. Finally, I go out on Friday afternoon and I take pictures of that treadmill. You're wondering, why is he talking about a treadmill? You're about to find out. I take pictures of that treadmill. I post it on Craigslist, sell this thing for $50. There was nothing special about this treadmill. It's an old treadmill. And I say, no Friday evening calls, no Saturday calls. Someone calls me and says, I want that treadmill. I want that treadmill. I had one just like it, and it broke about three months ago, and I want that treadmill. I live down in Pendleton, about 45 minutes away, and so we set up an appointment on Sunday morning. And so we pray about this. Sunday morning, we go and visit somebody who are helping with a project, and uh, um, this person corners us and says, you're moving, but what if God doesn't open a way for you? What if we, he will. We believe he'll open up a way. But what if he doesn't? And the words came out, then we'll pack up our stuff and we will move. And I think in our hearts we understood that that's what the case would be. 
We come back home, and uh, we're going to meet Tom uh, to, to sell the treadmill in a little while. Heather and I, feeling the weight of this, we kneel down and say, Lord, we feel like you're leading us to Illinois, but, but we don't know. We don't want to go by on our own, our own decisions. Lord, if that's where you're taking us, will you please confirm that to us? And Lord, be with us as we talk to Tom. Help us to be a blessing with him when he picks up the treadmill. The kids say, Tom's here, the guy for the treadmill. I'm getting on my shoes to go out front. My wife is not usually the one to deal with situations like selling things, but it was her treadmill. So she goes out the back into the carport, plugs the treadmill in just to make sure it's on and, and running. By that time, he already sees her in the carport, and he goes in there. I come out the front door, and, and he's already asking her questions. And she says, just so you know, there's nothing wrong with the treadmill. We're moving, and, I, and we're selling it. And he says, oh, well, where, where are you going? I hope it's not far away, she says, well, God, God's told us we're going a long ways away. Well, where, where are you looking? And uh, uh, she says, well, we've been looking, looking here and looking there, but uh, uh, now we're looking in Illinois. Oh, sorry, I, I got to back up because there's important parts of this story. That morning, my wife, on her own, in her prayer time, had said, Lord, I'm, I'm fine if you move us to somewhere. We're, we're going somewhere. We don't have any family wherever you're taking us, but please don't move us next to people who are mean. I'm, I'm fine if there are grumpy people, but Lord, let them, don't take us somewhere where the people are unfriendly. We have children, and we won't want to live where, where people are dangerous. Don't take us somewhere where people are unfriendly and mean. And she committed that prayer to God. So here she is talking to Tom, and, and she says, yeah, we're, it looks like we're looking in Illinois. And he says, oh, I'm from Illinois. They're the, they're the nicest people. They're friendly people in Illinois. My wife listens to that. And I'm out there, and we're talking a little bit more, and, and he's talking about moving from Illinois uh, when he, and seeing the mountains for the first time. And he says, well, where in Illinois are you looking? And we say, well, we're looking in the southern Illinois area. Oh, that's even better down there. We find out we have a mutual friend. We talk together. Uh, and then I help him. We, we, we load the, the treadmill up into his, the back of his truck and exchange the $50. He says, my treadmill broke three months ago. I've gained 30 pounds. Well, at that point, uh, the treadmill is loaded. I say goodbye. I turn around to walk back to the house, and for some reason, my wife tarries there in the street. For some reason, I know it's because of the Holy Spirit and the prompting of angels by her side. I'm already heading back to the house. She's waiting there. He's getting into his truck, and he literally turns around and looks my wife in the face and says, they're the friendliest people you'll ever meet in Illinois. You'll like it there. And she hears from God an answer to her prayer. And it was three months ago that God had told her, I'm going to move you far away. And I believe an angel broke his treadmill. And, uh, <laughs> and he's looking for this exact one. And he was only there in Pendleton for a short period of time before he's moving off. And so Heather comes to me and says, God answered my prayer. God, God confirmed. She's happy. But I, I don't want to make life decisions based on a man who buys a treadmill. <laughs> My wife goes in and says, children, do you think this is a coincidence? No, it's not. And so we kneel down together to pray. I know I'm missing details, and I don't know which ones. I'm having a hard time praying, but my wife says, Lord, if this is truly your, your will, will you, will you convict us again another time? She's getting ready now to, uh, to make dinner, and, and there's some things she needs. Grocery store is two blocks away. I could drive. It's November, but I say, kids, who wants to walk down with me? All the kids want to, so I'm waiting for them to get their shoes on, and I'm out in the street kind of waiting, and our neighbor is out. He's not out usually very often. But here he is, because he's got three jobs. He works a lot, but here he is out at his truck. I said, I'll, I'll take this opportunity. And I say, hey, uh, his name's Prime. I said, Prime, uh, just want you to know, we've appreciated being your neighbors for these past uh, six or seven years. Really appreciate you. I know there's no sign in our yard, but just want to let you know we're, we're selling our house and we're moving. He's like, oh, where are you going? I said, well, it looks like we're going to Illinois. He's like, oh, my whole family lives in Illinois. Which is, uh, he says, they're from Elgin. 
And well, there's an Elgin in Oregon not too far from us. And I say, you mean Elgin, Oregon? He's like, no, Elgin, Illinois. Which is surprising because his parents live on the, our street and his brother lives on the street next door. And we'd lived next to him for years and, and didn't know he was from Illinois. But not more than five minutes before, we had prayed, Lord, if you're convicting us to go to Illinois, then tell us again. So we're going to Illinois. That was November, 5th, that was November 28th. 52 days until the day that we are to move away. And it reminds me a little bit of Nehemiah. Build these walls in 52 days. Sometimes you wonder, did I really hear the voice of God? We had joy after that experience. But later on, you start to ask, did I really hear God's voice? Was that really him? How do you know it's God's voice? Because I cannot read in this book or this book any place where it says, sell your house and move to Illinois. But here's the answer. We had been asking for the Holy Spirit and we had been listening repeatedly. We had been confirming what we had been convicted of by God's word and by the spirit of prophecy. We knew that God was prompting us over time and he wasn't, he wasn't turning away that conviction. And this was also cutting across our natural desires. We were also encouraged by the testimony someone else gave. If your child jumped off of a wall, would you just let him fall? No, God will catch you. This was not presumption. And we have frequently had to go back and say, Lord, we're going to review the steps you've taken us through. Like this text in Numbers 33 2, Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. Moses wrote it down so they could review everywhere God had taken as word got out that we were leaving, leaving school and moving without knowing where or why, there was mostly support from people, but there were also a lot of questions, I'm sure, and discussion in people's homes. What are these crazy people doing? And there were some hard conversations. I remember being told, God would not tell somebody to do something like that. You're a father. Are you sure this is responsible for you to do this? That's an important question. And someone who was an encourager of mine said, if this is the biggest mistake you ever make, it's not that big. I'm not sure if you really heard God's voice right. As I shared one of those encounters with Heather, a darkness of fear descended on our home between the two of us. We could still turn back. We, we, we had not sold the house yet. I could go and tell everybody we were wrong. But what would I do? What would it be like to feel the conviction of God and to turn back and to turn away from it? What would life be like for our children in the future for us? God sent me encouragers out of nowhere. One man called me and said, I've heard that you have a story. Will you tell it to me? And uh, we, we'd been church members years past. I'd not communicated with him in a long time. And he said, I just want you to know, I've been praying for your family for years. That was an encouragement. And if you're praying for a family for years, keep on praying for that family. I know that the decision we made pushed others to ask themselves, am I really listening to God's voice and hearing him? Let me ask you, are you flowing along with just what is comfortable in your life? That's what I had been doing. In my heart, I knew that God was also telling me this, I'm not going to open a door for you to continue teaching. That was hard to accept. While I, I meant what I said when I, when I thought that in my mind and said it to a few others, it was difficult because teaching was a blessing, but it was God's blessing. And it was something that I was meant to hold loosely in my hands that didn't belong to me. Knowing our destination now, Illinois, we began searching with greater urgency. I prayed and said, Lord, lead me to the right realtor. I called a realtor in the local area, and she was such a blessing to us. In fact, months later, I found out, as she told us, my prayer group and I, we've been praying for you every single week as we gather. Thank you, Lord. I'm now calling 3ABN again, and still with no response. Because uh, that interview that was supposed to have been set up never happened. I call, no response. I call people in the conference in Illinois. I get no response. Someone says to me, hey, you got to call this number in Illinois. I call, I leave a message, no response. Somebody else says to me, I've got a good friend who does this. They're in Illinois, you've got to call them. I call, I email, I get no response. The only person who actually talked to me said this, you just got to leave it in God's hands. 
There's this theme here. God is not letting me control my future. And he's not letting me feel like I can handle it on my own. Heather and I get together after prayer meeting one Wednesday night and we say, well, maybe you can fly back there and you can figure some things out. And so we kneel down and pray, Lord, if you don't want me to fly back there, don't let me buy a plane ticket. I know how to buy plane tickets. We are dead serious. God would not let us buy a plane ticket. I mean, we could not buy a plane ticket. So we pray again, Lord, please, please help us. If this is not your will, don't let it go through. There's something about wanting to do something that makes you feel like you're getting it done. Heather went to bed rejoicing. God, God is opening and closing doors. I went to bed irritated. Lord, you're not letting me do what I want. I am slow to learn, so slow to learn find where I am in my notes here. <laughs> All my efforts had failed. I'm now receiving some job offers in other places other than Illinois. <laughs> places that start with I. Idaho. Iowa. But not Illinois. Meanwhile, there are people working behind the scenes who are a little worried and nervous, trying to get me a job somewhere. And so they're trying. Each week takes us closer. Lord, 47 days. You can do this in 47 days, God. 35 days. Okay, 35 days. That's less than 47, but 35, 25. Lord, I pray we have a dog. As if he didn't know that. (laughs) Why didn't God just take care of it right then? Why didn't he open up all the doors earlier? Christmas was different that year. Little by little, everything in our house is getting packed up. We have no home to go to, no job in sight, leaving a good job in the middle of the school year, in the middle of winter, and a terrible time to drive across the country, and a terrible time to buy a house. 2,000 miles with an unknown destination. I didn't know anybody who'd done anything like this. Except for one person. I'd read that book, Live Like Elijah, by Don McLafferty. Maybe I can find his phone number and call him. I look online. I find a couple phone numbers. I call them all. Nothing goes through. Finally, a friend of mine uh, asked me to go to lunch with him. He wanted to hear what was going on in our life. I'm talking with him, and out of nowhere, for no reason, he says, yeah, I'm going to meet with Don McLafferty. And I'm like, you know Don McLafferty? Like, you you have his phone number? Yeah, can I have his phone number? We've been praying about this. (laughs) <laughs> and God, he gives me his phone number. I call Don McLafferty. I leave him a message. And I get no response. He was actually in Africa. But the moment he stepped on the, off the plane, when he got my message, he called me on Christmas Eve. And oh, he was so encouraging about how to hear God's voice and to confirm you're walking in God's way. That was such a special blessing. God brings promises at his word at just the right time, like this one right here in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 12, as Jehoshaphat is surrounded by the the Moabite and Ammonite army. And he says, we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So what's the conclusion? How did God arrange everything in the nick of time before the day arrived for us to turn over the keys to our house? How did he arrange everything so we were able to walk peacefully and seamlessly from one house and job to another? Well, some friends gathered to help us pack the U-Haul. Anything that we couldn't fit in the U-Haul, we gave away. Family and a few friends joined us on the day of the close. Heather, Heather and I sat there in that office at the, the, the title office, signed away our house. Some friends and family gathered to pray to us, it's time to move. And in keeping with God's promise, not knowing where, but Illinois, not even knowing where in Illinois, we had a feeling Southern Illinois, but we didn't know. We went forward. We drove away. Couldn't help but connecting with this text right here in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house and go to a land that I will show you. I got to say, my wife Heather was positive and encouraging. God's leading us. If she felt any discouragement or despair or trouble, she did not let on. 
I'm still wrestling with God as over the next six days we're driving across the country in the freezing cold temperatures in the middle of winter. But for my wife, it was like this. We're just moving to a different bedroom in God's house. God's shown us. He's proven himself faithful. He's shown us we're going on the right way. We'll just keep on going. On Friday... On Friday evening, we stop in St. Joseph, Missouri, and we're going to take a break, a rest over the Sabbath. And so we pray. There's two Adventist churches that we could find there in St. Joseph, Missouri. We pray, which one, O Lord? And so we simply follow what we believe God is placing on our hearts. And they were so friendly there in St. Joseph, Missouri. And as I'm sitting there in this church, it's so friendly. I'm like, Lord, you could leave us here. This is a good place. This is a good spot to go. And, uh, uh, and, and they seemed to, they, they invited us to say, you, you could stay here. <laughs> Literally. <clears throat> and uh, they invite us to their potluck. And we're going out into the lobby to go to their potluck. And there we see the, the, the lobby is filled up with police officers. <laughs> we're evacuating the building. There's been a th- bomb threat. Everybody needs to leave. Are you serious? A bomb threat? And so we get in our car. I don't have a picture of this, but we have a picture of those police officers, fire engine, you know, several cars, and we drive away. And God was saying to my heart, no, 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 you're not staying here. This is not where I told you to go. I don't care how friendly it is. There might be a bomb here. I've talked to the people in in, uh, St. Joseph since then, and they don't know what happened that day. But God was telling me, don't stay here. After St. Joseph, Missouri, if you know the map, the next day you get down to Kansas City, you drive across Missouri, and you get into St. Louis, and then you cross the border into Illinois. We had been praying at every rest stop. We'd been praying at state lines. We'd been praying all along the journey. And uh, we had committed ourselves, when we drive into Illinois, we're going to stop and pray. And so the night before, I pull out a Google Maps. I'm doing the street view here. I'm figuring out exactly where we're going to stop to pray as soon as we get into Illinois. I've got this all figured out. And so when we're driving into St. Louis, uh, my wife called. I said, I've I'm, I'm, got to get gas. I'm driving the U-Haul pulling my tra- the trailer with my car, and Heather's driving the Suburban with as many kids as can fit in there with house plants and the dog, okay? This is, this is like Jacob with his family, and uh, Esau says, I'll give you armed men. He's like, no, 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 I can only go as fast as the children can go, all right? So we're, we're going a family pace here. My wife, I say, I, I want to get gas before we get into St. Louis, but as I'm driving through, there's no, there's no, I don't see any, uh, uh, what do you call it, gas station that's the kind you can pull a nice truck and trailer through really easy and convenient. So we're getting into St. Louis. My wife calls and says, why haven't you stopped for gas? Like, I, I didn't see any good spot. We'll stop after we get through the city into Illinois. So we're driving across the Mississippi River into Illinois, and I'm fully expecting, I'm speaking it in my mind, Lord, there's going to be a phone call. When I see that welcome to Illinois sign, there's going to be a phone call. Hello? Yeah, you're coming to Illinois. We got a house here for you, actually, and a job. Missouri, Illinois, no phone call. And then I'm I'm looking for that spot where I was going to pray, and nothing looks the same. Heather calls me and says, aren't aren't we going to stop here and pray? Nothing looks right. I'll wait till we get to that gas station. I'm driving along and I don't see any good gas station. We're now out of the city area and here's a gas station in front of us. And so, uh, but here's the problem. And not every one of you will understand this. Some, mostly of the men in the room or watching will understand. The gas station's on that side of the freeway. I want one on this side of the freeway. But at the last moment, God says, you promised you would pray. And so, hit the blinker, turn, pull off. I pull into the gas station. I get gas in the big old giant U-Haul and uh, I finish up gassing up and I pull the U-Haul uh, around and I, I park it there near the curb. And you can go to the next picture here. My wife is trying to get gas. Gas pump doesn't work. 
She pulls up the next gas pump. Gas pump doesn't work. So she pulls around to a different gas pump. She's about to pump, and some irritated-looking driver behind her uh, is kind of scowling at her. So she pulls up to the next gas pump. By then, I'm done. It's cold. And uh, being a good husband, I tell my wife to get back in the car. I finish pumping gas. And then I jump into the vehicle. And you can see that the vehicle pulled right up there in front of the U-Haul. That's where she then pulled to park. And we close our eyes and pray, Lord... Here we are in Illinois. You sent us here, but we don't know where to go, north or south. We feel like you're telling us to go south, but we don't know. Place it upon our hearts. Amen. And we open our eyes, and Sienna then says, Hey, Mommy, does that sign there say, Go ahead to the next sign, Perrin Road? <laughs> and sure enough, my name's Daniel Perrin. In case you didn't know why that's significant, Perrin Road. I had wanted to get back gas way back there. I had planned to stop to pray way back there. There have been no gas stations I liked all the way. I didn't want to stop at this gas station. She, this pump wouldn't work. That pump wouldn't work. Somebody didn't want her there. Right here. God put her right here so that she would pull forward and we would be aiming at this sign that an angel inspired somebody to name this road who knows how many years ago and place this sign right there so we would be parked right there. And we remember watching the Mending Broken People DVD about the founding of 3ABN and that story about the three-phase power. Sometime, somewhere past, God placed that there. Sometime, somewhere past, God placed that sign there. There are 10 parent roads in the country. This parent road, and, the, and most people don't spare, spell parent right. <laughs> like this. This one, a block that direction, is renamed to something else. You go about a quarter mile that way, and the name of the road changes to another name. But right here in the middle of nowhere, God says, you're going on the road I have sent you on. Amen. Go forward. My wife is joyous. She's exuberant. She's laughing, literally. But Lord, I don't have a job. And Lord, I don't have a home. Where am I going? So we drove down into Marion. We stay, we, and we, we find a home at the Holiday Inn Express for two solid weeks. My wife and I sat in the hotel lobby in the evenings, praying, talking, what is God wanting us to do? Just this past week, we celebrated two years since we rolled into Illinois. And we as, an, as a family on that evening, January 23, we went down to the Holiday Inn Express and we parked in that parking lot and we prayed, Lord, what's next? Where are we not going that we should be going? There's more to this story. God didn't just leave us unemployed in a hotel. You want the rest of the story? Some time passed. I had been, I had been looking around and I decided if, maybe, maybe if I call a pastor in southern Illinois area, they'll be able to help me out with you know, connecting me with a realtor. So I called Pastor Samuel Negria down here in southern Illinois. And he was so thoughtful. And he listened. And he prayed the most thoughtful and beautiful prayer with me. And he was on the road, and he says, well, I have somebody that I think I can connect you with who might be helpful. Let me pray about it, though, and I'll get back to you tomorrow. I was not expecting him to call me back the next day. This is in early December. The next day, though, he does call me back, and he says, the name that was on my mind, I'm giving you a different name instead. God's prompting. And so he shares me uh, the name of somebody, and he says, I've given, you, I've given your phone number to Dave Turner. It's like Dave's not going to call me. Dave Turner called me, and I, it's a 618 number. I like pick up any 618 number. What, what's happening? And so I talked to Dave, and here's the result of the conversation. He had nothing for me. He calls me again uh, before, before we, we move, and he, we talk again. I think, oh, he's calling. He's got something. Dave didn't have anything for me. But he says, call me when you get into Illinois. We'll have you over for lunch, for dinner. Well, as we're driving through Wyoming, all day long, uh, all day long, I'm feeling on my heart, call Dave Turner. Call Dave Turner. Literally, I'm hearing those words 40 or 50 times throughout the day. He has nothing for me, Lord, I'm not going to call him. I tell my wife that evening, and she says, well, do what God's telling you to do. 
I don't want to wake him up late. And so the next morning, we pray once again. We get on the road going through Wyoming, and I pick up my phone to call. Uh, I don't want to call Dave yet, so I call the realtor. And uh, so I called the realtor. Oh, don't you wish that you were faster to obey the Lord? This breaks my heart. Then I called Dave Turner. And guess what? He had nothing for me. The day after we drove into Illinois here, I decided, well, the door was closed at 3 ABN, but let me just go in there anyway. So I walk into 3 ABN, and, uh, I, and Jill's not available, but Lynette comes out. I don't know if Lynette's here. And Lynette said, are you that teacher who's driving from Washington? I was like, what? <laughs> they, they, they know me? They know I'm coming? <laughs> And she prayed the most thoughtful prayer for me there in the lobby. We set up an appointment to meet with Jill. And uh, so Heather and I are there with, uh, with both Greg and Jill having an interview. And Greg says, hey, did you call Dave Turner while you were driving through Wyoming? I said, yeah. He's like, yeah, he and I were out cutting wood together. And uh, while, while our saws were off, you called, and, and, uh, and, I, and, I saw I, and so Dave turns to me and says, there's, those, there's these people coming, and, and uh, you know, do you have anything for them? And Greg's like, I don't, I don't think we do. But he went and talked to Jill and said, uh, those people that you talked about, who you talked about earlier, they're actually driving out here. But here, here's the point of that. Call Dave Turner. And I called Dave Turner at just the time when he's out cutting wood with Greg and their saws are off and he's able to answer. And so I asked Greg at some point a couple of months ago, how many times do you go out cutting wood with, Greg, with, uh, with Dave? He's like, oh, that's, that's the only time I ever have. <laughs> but that was confirmation to us, to Heather and to me. I have placed you here and I've brought you here. I brought you to this spot. And I have a work for you, not because 3ABN or Southern Illinois or anywhere needs me, but because I need to know that I can trust God wherever he leads me and wherever he takes me. I need to learn to trust his hand. We did not come here because we were seeking a job. I really was willing to be a handyman, which, I mean, that's not my skill, but uh, Lord, I'll, I'll do anything. And I really want that to be true in my life. Anywhere that you open a door, and God did. And I have to tell you that God used Dave to open up a home for us to live in. We actually live in, uh, the, the, the story is just as long, with just as many interventions of God. I can't tell you the details about all of this, but remember that story about the three-phase power that was so meaningful to Heather. Would God really do something like that for me and he did there. We live in the home of Clarence Larson. We bought Clarence and Tammy Larson's house. And Clarence Larson, if you know the story, was instrumental in the one who was driving along and saying, yep, there is that power that God placed right there. And just another, another spot where God places upon our heart, can't you see how I have been the one leading you all the way? God brought us also to where there are wonderful friends, the friendliest people you'll ever meet in southern Illinois, including many of you. So I want to encourage you, whoever you are, if you are at a crossroads right now, I don't tell this story because I'm good at listening to God. In fact, I was terrible at it, and I still am. And sometimes when you've been somewhere for a couple of years, you start to not ask God as fervently and urgently as you did when you were living in what felt like an emergency. But we still are living in an emergency. And God is convicting my wife and I, you need to be praying more. If you're facing a crossroads, you can look at God's faithfulness. God is the same God then as he is now. And he will not let you go. He does not change. So why did I worry? Why do I still worry? Time and again, God has proven when I have listened to his prompting voice that he will take me to a good destination. That he'll, he'll let me face trouble along the way. God didn't want me to have everything worked out all the way on my own because then I wouldn't be trusting in him. You may be facing a decision right now to do something difficult or to do something impossible. That December, as we were preparing our house to move, I remember a sermon from this pulpit that talked about the Magi leaving comfort 
and following God's leading. And that was a great encouragement to me. I want to share one more word of encouragement from Desire of Ages, page 330, paragraph 1. Worry is blind and cannot discern the future. But Jesus sees the end from the beginning. In every difficulty, he has his way prepared to bring relief. Our Heavenly Father has a thousand ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Those who accept the one principle of making the service and honor of God supreme will find perplexities vanish and a plain path before their feet. I want to encourage you fathers and mothers who are hearing the prompting voice of the Holy Spirit to get your children out of the city into the country away from the temptations and influences of the city. The instruction that God has given through his word and through spirit of prophecy is clear and unmistakable. It is time to do that. And I'm thankful that God did that for our family. And he still, of course, once he's gotten you out of the city, he has a lot of work to get the city out of you. I'm not telling you to do exactly what we did. Please do not follow my example, unless it is this example right here, to plead for the Holy Spirit, to put away sin and distractions in your life, to prepare in advance for what you know God is going to ask you to do, and to listen, listen, listen. Since arriving here, I've heard many stories of people who have been moved by God. God wants the best for you. And his work is not just to put you into a new geographical place, but to move your character into the geographical place where it is identical with his character. At some point before Jesus returns, all of us will be asked to give up our homes. Where do we learn to practice that? Where do we learn to give up things of value for the thing of greater value unless God puts upon our hearts to give up something that we think is value? I don't want to be so tied to my earthly security that I reject God's leading. And right now, God is once again prompting my heart. Don't think if you come to my home, you're going to find a holy oasis of perfection. There is a holy oasis of perfection there when Jesus is welcomed gladly and perfectly. But we still are works under progress. Kids under construction, if you remember that old song. I want to end with a final text here from John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And this part right here, I go to prepare a place for you. We know he's done that for us here on earth. And I want to trust he's doing that for me in heaven. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So thinking big time, not just moving here on earth, thinking of earth to heaven, get ready to move. Don't get comfortable here. Pack and pray. Start to get today. Don't delay. That didn't come from me. I can't tell you exactly who that came from. I'm going to move you away, says God. Go forward in faith. I'm preparing a place for you, oh dear Father in heaven. Lord, it's, it's exciting to remember and recount how you've led in the past. Lord, I pray for this congregation here in this place and scattered throughout the world that you will give us a fresh testimony daily of going forward in the fight against sin and temptation all by the grace and glory of God. And Lord, prepare us to be people who are ready for that home in heaven. I pray this for your name, for your sake, and your glory. Amen.